I'd like to welcome Jeff and Joe from X Master to the Ripper Radio podcast for this evening. How are you guys doing? Doing great, man. What's up with you? Uh, rocking on as always. <laughs> always the best thing to do. Uh, I'd like to start off with um, maybe a history of the band, like where you guys got your start, and a little bit that way people can understand you guys a little bit. Well, I started the band in way back in '85. Uh, I was That's really, cool. yeah, I was really just a band uh, at first to play my original stuff, and uh, it turned into being a lot more than I thought that it would end up being. Uh, we did. We did a demo, and from that demo, we got signed to Azra International Records out of L.A. Did a, did an album, full-length album, and a picture disc with them. Uh, did a couple other releases that were done on some by some smaller places in Europe. And then the band uh, actually ended up, we changed our name and musical direction, which was one of the stupidest things I ever allowed to have happen in my life. I was bitched about doing it for over a year, and finally I said, screw it, everybody, you know, wanted to do this, I don't, you know, I'll try it, and that wasn't a good idea. But anyway, uh, well, during the time, there, there are still some decent good songs out of that time period. Oh, but- yeah. But it wasn't Axe Master. It was no. Awakening. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not trying to put down the stuff we did because we actually did do some pretty cool stuff. It's just a matter that, you know, we had a name and reputation worldwide as Axe Master. And to change it, and, you know, part of that had something to do with the fact that metal was, was going down so bad, especially in the States and, you know, around 94, you know, and the, the grunge movement was snuffing out the popularity of metal in the U.S. And the guys in the band wanted to play cover songs and they wanted to play stuff that was more commercial so that we could try and get gigs. They got to the point to where it was damn near impossible for an original metal band to get gigs around here. And um, so that's that's where that went. But during the time that the band wasn't active, um, two different uh, indie labels from Greece re-released um, pretty much all the stuff that had ever been released by Axe Master on three different CDs. They kept the name alive and got, you know, people people knew who we were a lot better because of that. And then in uh, 2010, I brought the band back totally to stay and uh, put this uh, lineup together, which is just absolutely killer. And it's best lineup by far I've ever worked with in any project I've ever been in. And, um, you know, we're just, we're going to take this as far as it'll go. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to either be dead or not be able to move my fingers before I give up on this project now. That's cool. Yeah. Um, see, uh, yeah, Joe started, re- started recording the new album in 2010 ish, uh, because he got a big, he got a big, uh, this is Jeff, by the way, he got a big, uh, uh, uh kind of. Uh, recognition is not the right kind of word, but a lot of people started sending them notes because uh, 2007 saw the re-release of uh, Blessing in the Skies, which was the first LP. And uh, so he started putting it back together all in 2010. And the, the lineup as it is now was not as was when he restarted it. Um, and I joined in, Yeah, I joined in 2012, was it, I think? End of 2012. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and uh, and Jim Jim, our bass player, was already in it, but it wasn't a it wasn't a gigging uh, deal. And the original drummer Brian Henderson was recording on that as well. Um, but uh, but as it stands now, it's me uh, me and vocals and Joe and Jim and Denny our uh, our drummer. Um, and this has been a real this has been a real good lineup, and I think uh, it's it, it, for for the most part I think it's going to stick around pretty much as is as far as we can see. Yeah, that, I mean, there's no drama here. There's no bullshit. There's no fighting. People caring about egos. 
you know, we're all we're all great friends. We're brothers, and uh, all all anybody cares about is that we make the music sound as good as it can. And nobody is out for their own personal glory or ego, which is really damn refreshing to find, uh, you know, more, a number of people who are like that. So I consider myself really fortunate to be able to work with these guys. Yeah, that's a hard commodity really to find in music today. Most people have their own little thing they want to do, and they don't want to truly work with each other and just create something cool, you know? Yeah, uh, it's kind of funny. It doesn't matter what the genre of music is. Um, well, let's be honest. Uh, uh, people in who are creative either tend to have a uh, an interest in what they want to do, um, and we're not, and, not. And, and, and or or they're just really hard to get along with. Um, there are some very nice people out there, but for the most part, you run the, the majority of folks you run into. They, they, uh, they kind of, we're, we're all a bit weird. <laughs> I mean, we might be really nice, but you know, every, but, uh, but there's a lot of people out there who take it a little too far and, uh, can't let go of what they want to do in order to be able to compromise. So yeah, you're right. It's yeah. hard to run across. It all comes down to that. And I mean, everything just goes, it just goes smoothly. You know, if I come up with an idea and the other guys don't dig it, you know, that's cool. If they want to change an idea that I had, you know, if I like what they're doing, you know, and everybody is free to be honest and open and nobody's an asshole about it. You know, everybody's cool about it, you know, if they want to change something or not do something. It's, you know, nobody, nobody has an issue with it. Yeah, it's really nice to be able to just say, you know, and in other bands, I've always been the blunt one to be able to go, no, I, I really don't like that. I don't think it sounds right. Um, but it's nice to be able to be blunt in this band and nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody's secure in who they are and what they do. Everybody's a music veteran and we, you know, we, we don't take it personally. You know, it's business. Yeah, and if everybody else really likes it and I'm the one outstanding, then, you know, I can let it drop. So, same goes for everybody else as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, since you guys have been around, well, especially Joe for the last 25 years, um, how would you say the music industry has really changed over the years as far as metal goes? Well, the obvious thing is, you know, the advent of the internet. You know, that, that's changed the whole ball game from the 80s and before. You know, I mean, I mean, the obvious difference in all kinds of music is, you know, you used to put out a vinyl album and that's where your income came from. When you toured, it was almost like promoting the album. Now it's just the reverse. You put out an album so that people can dig what you're doing and want to come see you on tour and you get the main amount of income a band gets is from playing live and selling merchandise. You know, it, yeah, metal was also more, uh, you know, back in the 80s when, and 70s when, uh, you know, we were all, you know, fresh-faced and going, you know, wow, this is great stuff and it was all new. Um, it was also, there was also a... Uh, um, it wasn't as accepted. Um, after a while, hey, I'm getting a double feed here. Maybe uh, somebody's speaker's too loud. <laughs> but after a while, uh, I uh, noticed that, especially now, you know, nobody really looks at you and says, "Oh my God, you're into heavy metal." Um, they don't. They don't make the assumptions that they used to. All that's still there. I mean, there are folks who will never really understand. But um, the the general view of heavy music is not nearly as uh, snobbish as it used to be. It's become mainstream so much because, well, thanks to Metallica and you know, and a few other bands, uh, there there's a huge there's a huge much more accepting larger group of people um, that might not be their thing, but they don't automatically assume that, you know, you're eating babies for lunch. Well, you know, and the thing is, too, back in the 80s, music like uh, 
Metallica was considered pretty extremely heavy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, since then, you know, now it's not. No. You know, with, with all the hardcore, screamo, you know, the different genres like that, you know, the music, the way we do it, you know, that we play is not considered anywhere near the heaviest kind of metal there is. No, but um, the, the general the general populace doesn't really extreme. think about that kind of yeah. The general populace doesn't think about extreme metal when they think about heavy metal either. They oh. they're not really thinking about that. But so there there's more of an acceptance too. So that's been yeah. a change as well. Yeah, and you got to figure too. A lot of the people that were the quote rebels that were into punk and metal in the late seventies, early eighties, you know, are in their fifties now. Yeah, in fifties and sixties. So you know the the whole the world has changed. Not just music. The whole world has changed, and everything in it, pretty much. Yeah, it seems like the uh, record labels they just kind of put your albums out now, and they don't really back you guys like they used to do. Well, well, record labels are broke. <laughs> no, record, record, record labels never really back people. Yeah. I mean, I, if, you're gonna be, if you're going to be honest about it, um, the only the only bands that genuinely got backed, um, a, a record label in the 80s and early 90s released about 2,000 albums a year. That's 2,000 albums in a year. And how many of those bands did you actually hear about? Uh, you, you heard about uh, a handful, uh, you know, maybe 10. Um, and that's because there was something about those bands that they thought the larger population would buy. So they paid to back those, and they didn't pay to back the other ones. And some of those other ones broke out and became huge anyway. Um, but, uh, but to be perfectly honest, uh, you know, most bands never really got any backing. And on top of that, on, on top of that, the labels also figured out how to claim recoupables. Yeah, so, that's what I was just going to say. You know, a lot of these things were the gen- were just, you know, average fans, they think, oh, this record label uh, was, you know, like bought them the ability to make this video or do this or do that. It wasn't that they were giving them that money. They were giving them a loan, basically. Yeah, you had to. You still. You had to pay that back, and you still do. Yeah. And I'm. I'm actually far more happy with how labels, the smaller labels, work today. I mean, the larger the label you get, like you know, CBS and Warner and all those guys, still operate on the same concept as they always have. But the new labels that cater to metal and things like that, they, you know, our. I, I won't get into details, but we don't get. Didn't get alone from Pure Steel Records at all. Pure Steel Records put out our album. Uh, yeah, they paid to have it pressed. They, yeah, they, had, they paid to have it pressed. All the expenses for that came out of their pocket. They're not, there's nothing that they're charging back to us. Um, uh, and then they did what they could as far as promotion and pushing our album. We were a priority for them for a few months. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, I prefer that greater, much more than the idea of, uh, of walking into a place and knowing that, hey, uh, the label is giving us $25,000 to do the recording and tour, and we need to make enough money back in order to pay that back. Yeah, the, I know of this band back in the 80s. They were a glam metal band, and uh, they, they got signed to uh, a subsidiary of Atlantic, and um, they they were under this impression, it almost seemed like that they were getting this stuff for free, and they went and they had the studio catered, and they took their time and all this crap, and they wound up with a bill, a, a whopping bill over $50,000. Well, their album only sold 30,000 units, which at that time, it was not, that much for a major label and the label dropped them boom the band owed the label fifty thousand dollars yeah and and that's that's before that's that money has to pay be paid back before any royalties 
and you know, it, it, the. Uh, Steve Vai got a uh, on a huge deal on Flexible. He hey got a label to distribute his album, and he paid for everything, which means that he got seven dollars on the album, which was an unheard of amount for uh, for any record label, any record to get per sale. Um, you know, you get on a major label, you get pennies per album, um, and. Uh, uh, and if you owe money, then the recoupables, which are quote unquote recoupables, um, those get paid back out of all your sales. Uh, and you don't get a, uh, a royalty check until that's paid back. And you got to remember that back back in the 80s, a lot of these, like, if you didn't sell 100,000 units, you're about done. Now, if you're selling 20, 30,000 units, you're doing good. Because record sales have just gone down so much since, you know, since the internet downloading all that shit. You know, the people are not going out and buying physical CDs like they did albums back in the day. Yeah, I've always had a rule that if I really was into a band, I still buy their CD. I don't do a download because I know that pennies on the dollar for every little snippet of a song, you know, nobody's really making any money that way, so I always make sure I buy a CD of somebody I really care about. You know. Yeah, and if we, and if more people did that, you know, the, the whole business would be in so much better shape. True. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, hey, I, and, and I, I will speak for all the bands, we appreciate when you do that, especially if you buy directly from the band these days. Um, you know, there are those guys out there that say they won't they have rationalized not buying an album because they think that the record label gets the money and the the the, the artist doesn't receive anything out of it. But, uh, you know, those guys, if they really thought that, they could buy the album directly from the artist. Yeah. yeah. There, are very, there are very few artists out there who don't have some of their own product. Um, uh, and, and those who don't are so big that they're not going to respond anyway. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah you write know, to Alec and ask him to buy Kill Em All, I don't think you're going to receive a reply. Nope. No, but but most, the majority of bands out there, the majority, because like I said earlier, uh, a record label back in the 80s or 90s released it, approximately 2,000 albums a year. How many of those bands or artists or comedians are, were actually still out there t touting their own album because you know out of the 10 folks that that la la label pushed hard all year are you know Speedwagon or Boston or whomever uh, how many other bands were still you know you know putting out the, putting their own album out and uh, uh, on their tables and on their, well, not the websites at the time, but uh, on their ta merch tables or through mail order, they were doing it themselves. So there's always a way to get that album without actually, you know, buying it from the label if that's what you object to. But, yeah, uh, I actually heard of labels back then that actually would sign a band as a tax write off. That yeah, I mean, it would be a business expense. And they yeah, wouldn't the, put anything into them. Yeah, yeah the 10, it, it, it came out as a tax write-off, but out of those 10 or 12, 10 bands that they pushed all year, and, uh, and that, so that leaves them with 1,990 albums out there that they didn't push. Uh, those other, those 10 make up the shortfall on the others. Yeah, that's, that's the business model for those, for those large labels. A lot of people don't realize that. They think if you sign with a large label that they're going to give you all kinds of perks and different things and that you've got, you've got it made. And they don't really know how what really goes on. There's a handful of books out there if you're really interested in it uh, that, uh, that, are, that are fantastic reads that get into that. But we've probably driven that into the ground at this yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got it there, bro. <laughs> I also noticed you um, you guys have been featured in a few independent movies. As far as the music goes. Yeah, a couple. Um, one of them, the most recent one, was a very, it was very s small indie thing 
that I don't know if it was ever even put out on DVD. Um, I know that it was taken to film festivals and things like that. Um, but the first one that we did was a, a movie called, it was actually direct to video that you could get at, you know, video stores and things like that, which was pretty kick ass to see your name in the credits at the end of a movie. That's cool. So uh, you guys are close to heading back into the studio soon. What can we expect from your uh, next album? <laughs> you know, this one's a bit more. This one's a bit more eclectic than the last one. Um, uh, the last one was uh, pretty universal sound uh, throughout the throughout the the songs. Um, there there were some differences, of course. I mean, you can't have everything sound exactly the same. But um, style, same yeah. feel. Same style, same feel for the most part on the last album. Uh, this one is a little more eclectic. There is uh, there's a couple very traditional metal tunes. Um, there's uh, um, some real thrashy stuff. Uh, there's uh, some very technical stuff too. Uh, it's a little bit of everything. Um, uh, and it, so it's kind of hard to like really nail down uh, but there's there's something for everybody on this one I think <laughs> well this one see the Overture to Madness I wrote all the music for it period by myself I even wrote a lot of the drum parts things that I created a lot of the drum parts um, and you know the album other than vocals and you know lyrics and that, which was which was all Jeff. Other than that, the the album was just me. I mean, I really got very very few suggestions about hey, why don't you try this here? Maybe two or three on the whole album. The whole rest of the album was just me in my studio creating stuff, and I rearranged a few things for Jeff's vocals and that type of thing, but that was really it. Now, this new album, we're doing it totally as a group effort. Um, everybody's involved in all areas of variety. So you're going to see, uh, you know, uh, several differences because of that, but don't think that we strayed from the same thing that we did on Overture to Madness, because we're still the same style band. You know, but, it, but it, it's, it's got more variety. It, it, it might be a little bit more interesting as a whole because of that. Yeah, it's not like we uh, changed our sound or uh, no. or altered or altered our outlook on music. Um, it, it's more uh, it's more um, uh, more of an amorphous concept than that. It, it, it still acts master, but but there's uh, there there's play there's a little play in it. Um, uh, some of the stuff I mean on, on Overture Man is lyrically and soundly and, and how it sounded everything was very heavy and dark and oh my god and while the new one yeah while the new one is while the new one is still dark there's a little bit of fun in there <laughs> well it's in that one tune it's really in that one tune but well, there's, there's, you're getting a lot more variety of influences, you know, when you're talking about, you know, Denny added some ideas, you added ideas, Jim added ideas. So, you know, you're getting more more different perspective of things than just me. Right. There's even one song on here that 90% that, uh, of it I put together, and then uh, we fleshed it out in, uh, in rehearsals, and I'm very proud of that one. Um, so yeah, yeah there, there's yeah, there, there. yeah there, there's a lot on this album from everybody everybody's input. Be honest, I, once this album comes out, I think I'm going to be the most proud of the writing of this album than of anything I've ever been a part of. Because I, I, you know, with the help of everybody else, what we usually do, I usually come up with the majority of the riffs, and then we'll, you know, we take it from there. And I mean, if I do say so myself, I think that I've been able to come up with the, probably the best stuff I ever did in my life. And when everything clicks, everything, you know, 
kind of flows and then it makes the music better that way. We used, when I used to play, we used to just do jam sessions and then songs kind of created out of those jam sessions every time. So I can understand where you guys are coming from for as far as influence. Yeah, usually what happens is, is I come up either with a riff or like a sample song with, with, you know, just a demo arrangement, bring it to everybody. If everybody digs it, we start working on it, and, every, and you know, we change what people think need to be changed, and we keep what they what they like, you know? But it usually starts off with me writing either a few riffs or a sample song, demo song, and then we tear it apart and turn it into Dr. Frankenstein. So what would you guys say your biggest in musical influences are? <laughs> well, we know no. you, Jeff. Yeah, well, Joe and I have one in common, um, and that's Tony Iommi. Um, I, I guess I technically have four. Um, have two for two that I, I think are fantastic. There, there are a lot more than that, of course, but I, I quote four. Um, two for guitar and two for uh, two for vocals. Um, uh, Tony Iommi and, of of the great Black Sabbath and uh, and Scott Ian of Anthrax and MOD and SOD and lots of places. Um, Scott um, was just a, he's just fun to watch and and is a solid rhythm guitarist. Um, and Tony, of course, is legendary, is, is the way he does his sound and his feel. Um, lyrically and vocally, uh, the two guys that I think are possibly the best lyr lyricists and uh, vocalists ever are uh, Ronnie James Dio and Warl Dane. Um, I don't have the range of either one of those guys. Uh, well, I might be able to match Warl these days because he, he doesn't have the range he used to. But uh, um, I really love how those guys phrased their words and put the way they sang over music instead of um, instead of with it. Uh, you know, Kiss, they always sang with the tune. You know, you, you knew the chord was going to be a word and the, the, the note was going to be the chord and you sang with it. And, and I, I was never a huge fan of that. Well, you get into that a lot when a, when, when a guitar player writes lyrics. Right. And uh, uh, I, uh, I always like the way guys, those, those two guys especially, sing over a song. I like their phrasing. Um, and I like the way they put things together and the way they think. Uh, so those four are, are my biggies. Yeah, I look at bands, uh, you know, for my writing style, I look at bands more than I look at individual artists. You know, yeah, I have individual guitar players that influence me, you know. Um, there's a bunch of them, but guys like, you know, Tony and then Michael Shanker, uh, especially the early stuff Kirk Hammett did, some George Lynch, just stuff like that. But as far as writing and feel goes, I like to, you know, I mention a whole band rather than, you know, one individual person. And I'd say that most of my writing comes out to be a combo of thrash and doom metal. You know, you got the Black Sabbath, the Doomy, maybe even some Candlemass. And then you've got like the early Metallica, some Slayer, stuff like that. You throw those two together, combine it with some Iron Maiden and early Sabotage, and that pretty much sums up my style of writing. I can definitely see some of those influences from the stuff I've played so far on the show. It's like if you took the stuff that Tony Iommi would write and then make it into thrashy, crunchy rhythms instead of just straightforward stuff. I do that a lot. Cool. Gotta be dark. Though. It's gotta be dark. If it ain't dark, I throw it out. Except for that one fall. <laughs> <laughs> Because these guys loved it, so I said, all right, well, what the hell? Doesn't hurt to be diverse. Uh, any upcoming shows or touring coming soon? 
We have something that is coming up with the band that uh, we're not really at liberty to talk about yet because we haven't officially announced it and we want to do that in a very big way. But um, we've been waiting to schedule shows until everything was put together with that and it's very close now. So um, you know, we haven't played a show in a while because of that. Um, but we'll be we'll be doing that soon. And we just signed with a management uh, company out of Las Vegas, and um, that was just within the last couple of weeks. So we'll be we're, we're hoping that you know the tour possibilities and the bigger show possibilities will be a lot more within our reach now that you know we have a professional official representation. Yeah, Austin, uh, uh, one of one of our big problems has been often um, bands, uh, or, uh, promoters, and, like, won't necessarily talk to a band. They think that if you don't have management, that they, uh, they, they, that you're not with it and together, so often they won't even talk to a band if you don't currently have management. Uh, and they won't care how much experience you have in the business. I mean, I've been doing this for 25, 30 years, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> right. So so we're hope- hopefully opening some more doors here with that. Cool. Uh, anything you'd like to say to your fans out there before we uh, wrap this up? You go. Uh <laughs> I wasn't really prepared for that. Uh, you know, the the fans fans of metal are are so cool. Um, you know, I I just went and hung out at Spring Bash uh, in Wisconsin last weekend and and had an absolute blast. You know, they're so welcoming and um, it, it's so. Look at you as a friend. You just haven't met yet. Yeah, right. Uh, so you know, anybody out there, you gotta. If you come to a show, come say hi to us. Um, you know, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna be like, uh, don't talk to me or anything like that. Uh, come say hi to us. Look us up on Facebook. Send us messages. Um, you know, uh, we might not get back to you that second, but you know, we will. Uh, I, I'm always down to talk to fans. I'm a fan myself. I, I'm as big a goofball about music as as anybody out there. Um, so you know, call us, check us out. Um, I don't know, not call us. I guess you don't really have our phone number, but you know, send us a message on Facebook. Send us a message on Facebook or stop by our website and send us an email. Say hello. Uh, if you if you catch us at a show, don't feel that you can't come back and to the merch table and sit and talk with us because that's cool too. Um, always down with meeting other metal people. It's it's always a good thing. Um, so you know, horns up and you know, stop by our website and. Say hi. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the coolest things about being in a band like Axe Master is that I, I love meeting new people and I love getting the opportunity to meet fans from all over the world. I mean, that is one of the most kick-ass things about being in a band like this. I don't get musicians who think or act like that they're better than their fans. I mean, they're missing the point. You know, we're all, we're all metal fans are a big family, you know? And, and there's nobody better than anybody else. And I love talking to people, and, and I'm honored that people would want my autograph or want pictures taken with me or something. It's not, it, it's not a pain in the butt. To me, it's an honor, you know? I mean, yeah, check out our website at xmasterofficial.com. We're all over the damn internet. You don't have to do much to find us. We're everywhere. Um, I yeah, there's only one. Make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work my ass off to make that happen, and uh, you know, definitely be looking for new material. It ain't gonna be for a little while yet. Um, you know, we haven't even started recording. You know, so it'll be a little while. But you can rest assured, there's going to be more Axe Master albums, more Axe Master shows, and this band is going to. Is, we are in this for the long haul. This is not just a uh, one-trick pony. We're we're in this to kick some international ass for years to come. Cool. 
Well, I appreciate you guys coming on the show tonight. Um, I hope to have you guys on again probably around when you guys um, put out your new album. I'll have you guys back on to talk about it. If it's our pleasure, Brian. Yeah, man, it's always great to do. Cool. Alrighty, well, until next time, horns up. Horns up, brothers! Glad you could stop by. Here, have some candy. <laughs>